Hello there, philosophers, esotericists, and scholars. I'm Terry Burns, and I'm going to be talking to you today about the Turba Philosophorum. This is supplementary material for a class I'm teaching online, playlist below, on the Monas Hieroglyphica or Hieroglyphic Monad of Dr. John D. And also, in this case, it relates to D. and Kelly's later angel magic as well. So, the Turba Philosophorum is the... Um, often translated as the assembly of the philosopher. Those of you who are in my class who are at least through theorem 15 know that its most famous quote, nature rejoices in nature is one quoted by D or at least it seems to be because as you recall, um, the Monus Hieroglyphic is of course in Latin but this quote he writes out in Greek. Now it appears multiple places. The most common place is the Turbo Philosophorum. It's certainly something D read but we are going to be talking about it in connection with another work of his that was probably one of the most secret books he owned. He never listed it in his library catalog and so on. And that's the Codex Marcianus Graecus 299. I'm going to have a separate video on that one when I'm done here. But what I want to look at here in terms of the Turbo Philosophorum is, of course, what is it? Why does D seem to allude to its concept of nature, which is repeated in the Turbo over and over and over again? And then it's going to get very interesting in the Turbo because we're going to see all of these ancient Greek philosophers talking about angels. And we might wonder why that is. And then, as I've already mentioned, I want to not just say that it connects to these oldest alchemical source, the Codex Marcianus Graecus 299, which, by the way, I'm just going to be calling the Codex from here on. Uh, but how does it? Um, and the first way, I'll just tell you now, they have the same concept of nature. So does someone else he refers to Democritus, who we now know as a pseudo Democritus, meaning someone writing under that name. Um, but in the Codex, more than the other two by far, the ideas are going to be even more overtly sexual, and they're also going to more overtly combine Egyptian and Hebrew motifs, especially in the relationship of an angel called Amnael with Isis the prophetess. But that's in the Codex. That's the next video, although I can't really talk about the Turbo without talking about the Codex, so you'll hear a lot about both of them in this video. And one of the things that we might be asking all the way through is how these works connect to Egypt and the tumult after, say, the burning of the Library of Alexandria, which is now, to, it's, that's probably 500 years before this. But at one point, Alexandria, Egypt is the seat of great learning. It's the linguistic center of late Greek as a language. And both uh, this work and the Codex will come from Egypt. Also, turba. Uh, turba means tumult. This is usually translated as the assembly of the philosophers, but turba doesn't mean anything like assembly. It's just that the philosophers are talking to each other very nicely, and it, it doesn't seem like there is a tumult. What the tumult is, at least in my opinion, is the background of this. Now, it's too long after the burning of the Library of Alexandria. It's not that exactly. But what it is, is this tumult of northern Egypt and the many different views there that seem so different that get mixed into this great kind of synthetic stew that combines Egyptian beliefs, Hebrew beliefs, Muslim beliefs, Christian beliefs, and whatever kind of pre-Abrahamic religion beliefs that might be there. Anyway, Martin Plessner, who is a modern German translator, calls it a most remarkable attempt to put Greek alchemy into the Arabic language and adapt it to Islamic science. Remember, in Europe during the Dark Ages, the sciences or proto-sciences and math kind of disappear, but they're flourishing in the Arab world at that time. That's why we use Arabic numerals today to write with, or why algebra has that name, since all is the, uh, the Arabic article. So this work, the Turba Philosophorum, is not written in Greek. It's written in Arabic around 900 AD, but it will become one of the oldest European alchemical texts. It appears sometime in the 1300s, um, there even seem to be places where one of Dee's favorite physical alchemists, George Ripley, who I've talked about in other videos, seems to have read the Turba. 
can't prove that that's true, but it sure seems like it. Um, it doesn't come out in print until eight years after the monad. The monad's 1564 and it comes out in 1572. But there is virtually no doubt that Dee saw manuscript copies of it, given his propensity for book and manuscript collecting and that he's traveling around a lot collecting books right before the monad and he's interested in alchemy and it is one of the oldest European alchemical texts. Now, the other one that I'm talking about in the next video, the codex is kind of a different situation where copies aren't around all the place and no one knew Dee had a copy, um, but we'll get to that later. So. The general frame in the Turba is that there are nine early Greek philosophers and they're discussing the origins of the world and matter in 72 dictums. 72, as you know, if you're in my monad class, is uh, it's important as a processional number. It's important as the number of the Shemham Foresh. And there are all sorts of things like that we could analyze in the Turba, but we're not. I'm going to keep a pretty narrow focus basically on the concept of nature and why angels are there. So... Um, the ideas of these early philosophers who are pre-Socratic and Socratic, which basically means platonic because we know about Socrates because Plato wrote, I mean, Plato wrote down what Socrates said, right? Um, they're presented via dialogue, but just kind of like platonic dialogues were. And by the end, they're shown to support the teachings of Islam. But basically, uh, it's easy to bring these into a European Christian setting because they're not contrary to Islam, they're not contrary to Christianity, because the idea stressed is of one God. Of course, in Arabic, that God is Allah, but Allah just means God. So when they come into English, for example, that gets translated as one God. Um, there's two recensions, one that's very long, and one that's a lot shorter, and multiple fragments. And I've already told you that turba means a tumult. It has the same root as our words like turbulent, turmoil. Uh, it can sometimes be a throng of angry people. But as I said, the philosophers don't seem terribly angry here. They're just talking. And they often speak of angels and what angels are composed of. And that might seem kind of strange to you. At least it did to me when I first uh, looked at it until I remembered a little of the little I know of Greek, which is that where does the word angels come from? Um, now, our idea of in within Christianity or Islam or Judaism of an angel is very different from an idea of attendant spirits in, in ancient Greek uh, or in ancient Greece. But the word comes from Greek, angelos, which literally means a messenger. Oh, like Hermes, like we've seen in the monad with all the play on Hermes, philosophic Mercury. Now, does that make sense how it might? Intuitively, you might see already how this would connect to alchemy, right? If you have a concept of philosophic Mercury and the philosoph philosopher's stone, and we're thinking of, oh, Mercury, a messenger, both um, Hermes, because in pre-Christian Greek writing, it could mean an attendant spirit or a demon as a messenger. But the use in the Turba is clearly more modern. They're talking about angels within Abrahamic religions, actually within Islam is where they're talking about angels. It gets brought into Europe and the angels miraculously become Christian angels. No one says that, it's just that's how everyone reads it. Um, one thing you might wanna know is that the, the current religious usage of angels in with the Greek angelos first appears in Alexandria, Egypt, which as I mentioned was the center for Greek learning, though it's in Egypt. And it um, shows up in the Septuagint, which is basically like the Old Testament, which is in Hebrew translated into, uh, into Greek. And it's a translation then of, it's how the Hebrew word Malik, or for messenger, was translated. Malak, I'm sorry, but the vowels aren't there. Nine, um, what goes on in the Turba is that nine early Greek philosophers are discussing the origins of matter in 72 uh, dictums, like I said. Um, now, here is the problem. <laughs> you have a text that is written in Arabic. It's talking about ancient Greek philosophers written during the flourishing of the arts and sciences in the Muslim world while Europe is in the dark ages. But you 
drag names through enough languages and they change. So the Greek names go through Arabic, then into Latin, and now in English where we have different translations of those Greek names. So someone like Pandolphus will be speaking and it's maybe not that obvious that, oh, this is the person we now tend to call Empedocles or um, Leucippus is another philosopher we look at often. Well, he's, he becomes Lucas. And there are lots of examples of that. The only two names that don't seem to change much or always stay identifiable are Socrates and Pythagoras, unless you're really good with linguistic switches and looking at what kind of endings get put on names. So the identifiable philosophers are going to be Anaximander, Anaximenes, Anaxagoras, Empedocles, Archelaus, Leucippus, Exophantes, Parmenides, Pythagoras, Socrates, and Xenophanes. And you can, on the last slide, I'll list some scholarship. You can go to one of those articles and find somebody who painstakingly shows how every name is morphed, but I'm not gonna get into that here. Um, you can identify the speakers to a certain degree by their beliefs, by their philosophies, shall you know them, but uh, their beliefs have morphed a little bit also. So you have to kind of imagine, well, how would you express this in a monotheistic framework? So Pythagoras, for example, who we might rightly associate with numbers, talks a lot about angels. Scholars who have ventured an opinion on where the turba came from, um, all of those scholars that I know of suggest that it's probably from Akmim, which is in Upper Egypt, and it's a place that the Greeks at one time called chemists, think chemistry, alchemy, and even before that, Panopolis, if you know the work of Zosimus of Panopolis, who will be in the Codex, which we'll look at in the next video. So what I want to do is look at one modern translation. This one is from Adam McLean. Some of you probably know um, his Levity.com website. It's a wonderful collection of alchemical texts. He also teaches classes on um, understanding alchemical symbolism and for the last several decades, he has been translating or alchemical works from Latin and publishing some of them. For example, uh, one of them that he'd published that was translated by Campbell, uh, the Vo Archidumia, I have already used in my class on the hieroglyphic monad. But let's look at the one that he has on his alchemy website. Um, I'm going to just read the introduction and then I'm going to do something that may leave scholars aghast. I'm just going to word search and look for the word nature because it appears 75 times here in the first half. It appears around 150 times in the whole turba. Um, all right, let's get started here. It opens here with the epistle of Erisleus, prefix to the words of the sages, uh, telling the intentions of the book. And Erisleus, begotten of Pythagoras, oh, a disciple of the disciples by the grace of thrice great Hermes, learning from the seed of knowledge. Thrice great Hermes, of course, Hermes Trismegistus is the author of the Emerald Tablet. In my monad class, we've looked at how that is a hermetic work and how we have allusions to thrice great Hermes and the Emerald Tablet on the frontispiece, in the letter to Maximilian, in decalling his monad glyph, his London seal of Hermes. And then we have two theorems, 14 and 19, that are essentially restatements of things from the Emerald Tablet. So um, what we are told here is that this person opening the turba is a disciple, is begotten of Pythagoras, and is a disciple of the disciples of the thrice great Hermes learning from the seed of knowledge unto all who come after and wishes you health and mercy. And I, uh, he continues saying, I testify that my master Pythagoras, the Italian master of the wise and chief of the prophets had a greater gift of God and wisdom than was granted to anyone after Hermes. Okay, here's a little side note for you. See if you can find out um, how Hermes would be translated into Arabic because this one has come into English as we know it. So just a little something to look at. Now let's word search here through with nature. Um, we first get a certain nature, which is perpetual, co-equaling all things. Nature is perpetual. All right, we're going to have nature rejoicing in nature because nature, remember, is not our modern idea of countryside. The nature to the ancients, to the people 
um, writing at this time and then in Dee's time. It is the essence of a thing. Um, there is a visible nature, a hidden nature, but we're not talking about like nature is a plant. It's the essence of a thing. So as they continue talking about nature, um, the ends to which their nature brings to them are beheld and summoned. Then we get into their four natures. These are going to be associated with the four elements. Um, so like uh, the nature of fire would be hot and that kind of thing. More discussion about four natures will continue for a while. Then we'll find that nature confesses that God is a partaker. So God partakes of nature. Humans have nature. This develops into, as we go through, the idea that nature rejoices in nature, nature begets nature, that anything that you beget has your nature. So if God created us, so goes the line of thinking, we are part of the nature of God. All right, we're going to get more natures. Uh, we're going to get a lot of references to the sun. I'll talk about why that might be in a bit here. Um, there are natures that were one, like the monad. Pythagoras has a monad. Of course, D has a monad. Uh, it's an idea that everything is connected to the one thing. That's in the Emerald Tablet of Hermes. But now their external natures are being made different, made diverse by God. As we And we will go through some discussion on that. Then we're going to get the nature of truth. These are philosophers, after all. Of course, they're going to look at the nature of truth. Their um, natures will meet their natures, follow them, and rejoice, starting to sound like nature rejoices in nature. Um, nature is ruled by nature, which destroys it, turns it into dust, reduces to nothing, and finally herself renews, re uh, repeats, and frequently produces the same. We're back then to the nature of truth, how nature should be united to one another. Um, if you know, if you don't know the nature of truth, don't don't do alchemy. And now here we have the direct uh, lines, except in a different language that D has in the monad. Nature rejoices in nature. Nature contains nature, and this will continue on. I'm only through a few usages of them. Less. Uh, and there's, there are many more to go, so I'm going to stop looking at that, and I'm going to go back to my other slides. But you can see how much nature is um, used here, and a logical assumption when D sets out this nature rejoices in nature, and then returns to it a bunch of times, is that it is from this most common circulating uh, and one of the oldest European alchemical texts. Now, is it really? We'll see after this and the next video. My answer to that will be why yes, but not only from there. Um, briefly, you get the same idea, and I've already talked about that in my class, in some of the pseudo-Democritus texts, and we're going to get the same thing expanded in uh, the codex. But all right, linguistically, I think the best translation to look at is the one I just showed you by McLean. But I'm going to direct you to look at this one by Arthur Edward Waite, and I want to explain why. This was 1896, so it's it's been over 120 years since this came out. Um, there was a modern reprint uh, that Orboros Press did. I think it's out of print, but you can find this on uh, for free at archive.org. You may know who Arthur Edward Waite or A.E. Waite is. He was very into Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry. He, uh, he was into ceremonial magic. He was part of the original order of the Golden Dawn, then quit, then like many people, started his own order. He corresponded with Crowley. He was a, a scholar very into magic, although contemporary scholars don't refer to him very much any more than they refer to the translations of another uh, Golden Dawn scholar, Westcott, who, and I think it is because it's clear that looking at this is kind of part of Waite's quest, but he is a decent scholar, and he does some things that modern scholars don't do, which I'll talk about. Another thing he tended to do, though, that wasn't very pleasant was snipe at everybody, so he, he didn't make a lot of uh, of friends. 
he and Qu uh, Crowley predictably had a falling out, but he had a falling out with people of far gentler natures than Crowley. The thing is now, it's hard to find a good translation unless you have access to an academic library, although I'll give you citations at the end. But what happens if you get an article on it is that scholars tend to be talking to other scholars. So they think that you know the context. And if you don't know the context, it's easy just to think, well, okay, this is weird. Why are the ancient Greeks talking about angels next? So Waite's version, first of all, he's gonna compare the long and short versions because there's some substantial differences. Um, he understands the significance of the nature rejoices and nature quote, in terms of angel magic, which is something he's interested in. And the most important thing is he understands the connection between this work and the works of Zosimus of Panopolis and the Isis, the prophetess to her son Horus letter, which is in the codex that I'm looking at in the next video. Now, it's hard to realize that he's talking about the codex because the way he cites it is always to the work of Marceline Berthelot, who is a French chemist and general all around genius who was very good with languages. He translated things from Greek, Syriac, Arabic. He republished a lot of ancient Greek works in Greek, but with uh, so that you would have a, a book of it and not have to just, you know, look at, at some older printed version. Um, the difficulty with that is there's a reason that there's the saying, it's all Greek to me. Not many people read Greek anymore, except people who are Greek. And so going through Berthelot's many reproductions of ancient Greek text in Greek is wonderful if you can read Greek, but many people can't. So trying to find what page in the hundreds of pages of Berthelo where there is the Isis, the prophetess fragment is difficult. And I say that from experience because while translating the monad, I had right here from interlibrary loan, all of Berthelo's text and going through them was not fun and made me wish that my Greek were lots, was lots, lots better. Um, but whenever Waite is talking in this translation about Berthelo, you can figure chances are good he's talking about the codex. And anytime he's talking about Isis or uh, Horus or fallen angels, he's talking about the codex. As I mentioned, John D. had a copy of the codex. He probably got it um, while, while traveling in Italy, which was just a few years before he wrote the hieroglyphic monad. And D scholars didn't realize until the end of the last century that D even had a copy. Like I mentioned, he didn't list it in his library catalog and it, um, it didn't show up on their radar until really around the 1990s. Robertson Watson, who wrote about Dee's library catalog, found it and listed it there. It was in a municipal library in Germany because when Dee, a couple decades after writing the hieroglyphic monad, he traveled around the continent and had um, angelic adventures with Edward Kelly. When Dee and Kelly went their separate ways and Dee was coming back to England, right after the Spanish Armada had sailed around and the Invincible Armada had been defeated, 1587, I mean, 1589, pardon me, not 87. Um, and he leaves it with uh, the Landgraf of Hessen. Now, some people in Germany knew it was there. Um, I found out it was there from Agnes Klein's German translation of the Monus Hieroglyphica, and no less a, a German literary light than Goethe himself had looked at it. But D scholars in the United States and England and Australia and English speaking countries didn't seem to realize it was there. Okay, let's get back to the Turba and look at some examples from Waite to see how this would connect to both the Hieroglyphic Monad and to D and Kelly's later angel magic. So what we are going to do is just jump in. Obviously, I'm jumping in about page 17, and I, um, I want you to know here all the references to the sun. Why? Well, to adapt this to a monotheistic religion in Alexandria isn't very hard because before the end of the Egyptian dynasties were monotheistic, right? To form the the main god was the sun god Ra. And we have already seen, those of you who are in my monist class, all the associations of the sun with gold, with 
Tifereth with um, S-O-N. So that's an easy meshing. At the bottom of this, we are going to see that um, Waite has extensive footnotes because he's trying to help you understand this as you read it. I find that a very helpful do, thing to, to do. So when Pythagoras jumps in here at the eighth dictum, um, we still have this long footnote at the bottom that um, Waite has from the last speaker. Um, who he is, Eximenes, but that's really Epictus, who is a Stoic philosopher. Anyway, as, as this goes on, um, what we are going to find is Pythagoras talking about the elements. And that will make sense because if you um, watch my video on the context for these hieroglyphic monad, for example, or if you just know Plato's Timaeus, which is a Pythagorean cosmogenesis. Um, number and shape are, of course, associated with forms. These become the perfect Neoplatonic forms. And all right, all that is matching fine. Down here, weight will help you connect this to other works of Arabic alchemy particularly the work of Geber, now called Jabir, who is probably the biggest name in Arabic alchemy of that time period. And then he is going to um, do things that relate to what we call angel magic, which tend to be, it's very hard to distinguish between that sometimes and alchemy for reasons that will become apparent in this video. Um, but uh, if you look at the bottom of this quote on page 19, when he's quoting Geber, by the help of these elements, God created the superior and inferior worlds. It appears there that Geber, like Ripley, like D, is referring to um, an inferior and superior astronomy, and not the way, as I've talked about in other videos, that astrologers use it. They're using all of the planets and just talking about what is below as a reflection of what is above, the celestial being the superior and what is on, the, on Earth or the terrestrial being inferior. Okay. Um, one of the other things that weight is really good about understanding is that um, the synthesis of Greco-Egyptian Hebraic alchemy and Gnostic mysticism that came, that was by far the most pronounced in Alexandria, Egypt, and secondarily in Panopolis, which a modern Achmene, you can, and in another name of Achmene chemists, you understand, gee, alchemy or chemistry. That's because Chemis or Panopolis or Achmene was for a couple centuries renowned for the scientific work and the arts that flourished there. The center of Greek ling language and literature was Alexandria. Um, but these places are like an intellectual center of this tumult of a mixture of what is Egyptian um, and what is Hebrew? What is Christian? What is Muslim after the founding of Islam? And in that tumult, we get angels where you wouldn't expect them. So what you also see here on page 19, and take some time and look at, the, I mean, it's free online. Take some time and look at it more on your own. You have a discussion with Pythagoras about the angels whom he created out of fire. And then you get a discussion of why the angels were created out of fire and why they aren't made of earth and things like that. Well, Pythagoras talks about the elements or we actually have nothing direct of Pythagoras, but Pythagoreans talk about the elements like Plato and the Timaeus as Timaeus talk about the elements, but he doesn't really discuss angels unless you stretch it out. That's because that idea has already gone from the Greek meaning of a messenger or attendant spirit to the common Jewish, Christian, and Muslim meanings of angels. All right. So 
Um, and this will continue. The angels are more lucid than the sun, moon, and stars because they're created from one substance. Well, if you're going to talk to something, you want it to be lucid, right? Um, and what concerning the creation of heaven? Well, you could stretch here and say, well, if Pythagoras is talking about heaven, that must mean um, the world of being, like from the Timaeus, and we're in the world of becoming. But heaven is not usually the language that would be used. Okay, oops, I skipped over something there uh, on page 21. Well, there was something there about Adam being created of the four elements. I'll just move on. Um, here on page 22, you're going to get um, a, something that I consider rather humorous from Waite. So let me just read this to you. Waite says, as this discussion of the angels continues, that the nature of the angels and the question whether they eat or sleep does not seem to have been discussed either by Greek, Syriac, or Arabian alchemists. Really? I wonder why. I don't know. I'm easily entertained. The idea is there has been a creep of this idea of angels. So now we are going to talk about, well, what are they made of? And it's easier to talk to them. So maybe we should. Um, I've already told you that it's, the word angels comes from the late Greek angelos. It literally means uh, messenger. Now, we're going to look at something on page 23 here that is really important, and it will get to be even more important when we get to the codex. Um, having a little sun coming in from the morning, but I'll just let that keep going. So Zosimus narrates that the art of alchemy was revealed to mortals by the fallen angels. That's very important in the life of, for example, John D. Alchemy was revealed to mortals by the fallen angels. That doesn't appear in ancient text. It starts to appear in this tumult of Alexandria and Panopolis. So then you would want to talk to the angels to find the secrets of alchemy, right? Which in fact, D and Kelly later do. And if you look at the things that they think their great table of earth in Enochian magic contains, one of the things it contains is the secret of alchemy. It's matching this idea from Zosimus of Panopolis, whose texts are in the codex, the next work. So you have this discussion about why is it that angels don't eat and don't sleep, and that um, the commentary that Wait continues is saying, in the discourse of Isis to Horus, the mother of the gods, Isis, appears as a prophetess who obtained initiation into the mysteries of alchemy from the great angel Omniel, who desired to possess her. Well, more than possess her, he rapes her in this story in the Codex. Omniel, uh, the ending of that name, El, is the ending that you usually get in a, a god name in Hebrew. Um, think of archangels Raphael or Gabriel, Mikael. Well, here's Omnail. Omnail doesn't seem to appear anywhere that we know of except in the Codex. Um, then this section will end on page 25 with an I, with idea again that, well, this is secret. I'm going to put it at the end of the book, but this is secret. And Wait will refer you to the Codex. The necessity of concealing the art is one of the chief anxieties of the Greek alchemist. Isis herself is sworn to secrecy by heaven and earth and hell, by the four elements, by the height and depth, by Hermes, by Anubis, by the howlings of the Kerkeros. Right. Okay. In the Codex. What? So what you're seeing here is that he keeps bringing in more notes about the Codex, which he is in effect reading to understand the Turba. And the Turbo Philosophorum makes a lot more sense if you have read the Codex. So perhaps what we are seeing here again with John Dee's usage of it is something he does um, frequently. I mean, he refers to something as if you know it. If you don't know it, you can't understand it. Now he's doing a double version of this, as we will see by the end of this video and the next, where he seems to be referring to the Turbo and Democritus, and really what he's saying will make the most sense if you look at the codex. Um, the ninth dictum starts up, uh, this Eximenus, who is really, like I already mentioned, 
uh, Epictus, the Stoic philosopher, he also discusses angels. Most of them discuss angels. So they continue on and, um, and talk more about angels. I think I'll leave you to read that on your own. It will continue. Wade is reading Berthelot's Compendium that includes the Codex Marcianus to understand the Turbo. And so on long notes like this, when he's referring to Berthelot, just think Codex Marcianus. Um, you have within the Codex numerous preparations that can be used in physical alchemy. Some of them actually work. Some of them are from the oldest known alchemist who was really a person. More on all of that later. Um, but just understanding this text and the codex will help you understand some of the strange words that John Dee makes up and why it's so hard to trace them. Yes, one reason it's hard to trace them is because the Greek texts have a lot of them vanished, but also he is referring to things very obliquely. I'm thinking of um, like when he talks about um, in one of the early theorems of alchemy as a gold coral work and he gets this uh, basically uh, chrysocorallios, chrysocorallian, it becomes in, in uh, if we put it in a Latinized English. This word doesn't come from the turba. It may come from a pseudo-democritus text, but it also could just come from the, um, from the codex. If you want to find that out, I'm, I'm handing you a research topic because I don't really want to go through every Greek word in there and see if that is there. And maybe some of you can uh, digitize it in word search in Greek and find out on your own. Um, in a, when you refer in this era to alchemy as chrysopoeia, something else that um, is done in Democritus and that D does, and other texts do this also, it's implicit that this part, the chryso part, is alluding to Christos. I mean, it's this chiro, X and what? And X looks like a chi, so chi rho is the cr, cre, Christos, the anointed one, Jesus. And you're trying as part of, theoretically, as part of studying the monad to anoint yourself. D makes that all but explicit. So you get all kinds of syncretic twists that, Either you find delightful or they drive you nuts. I'll um, tell you one that um, Agnes Klein came up with in her German translation of the monad when she got to the light of the cross theorem that many of you have studied. That's um, theorem 16 when D makes LVX his central symbol. So we have LV the LVX and she says, um, oh, well, this extrusion of coral gold is related to LVX and it's related to INRI, the initials above Jesus on the cross, and you should take the crucifixion as a cosmic alchemical allegory. Now, if you haven't done any esoteric work, if you don't know about this tumult in northern Egypt and the way things are mixed together, when you get to something like that, you might just go, what? How can the light of the cross be a cosmic alchemical allegory? Well, join my class in the Hieroglyphic Monad and find out. Um, she notes that INRI exoterically, of course, is Jesus Nazarenus Rex Judeorum, Latin for Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, but it's often used by alchemists as igne natura renovatur integral or through fire, nature is reborn whole. And what are angels made of? Why fire? So the connection to angel magic, if you are thinking like this, is explicit, okay? I'm not telling you this is some great truth. I'm telling you this is why people thought that way. All right. Uh, now, here's an interesting twist. Remember, back when D writes this out in Theorem 15, he writes, nature rejoices nature in Greek, not in Arabic or Latin. And the Turbo Philosophorum is Greek philosophers, yes, but it's written down in Arabic and translated into Latin. So it's as if he's emphasizing his source is Greek. This is where he's doing this sort of, of feint, because the likely source 
not just according to Dr. Turner and myself. This is something Agnes Klein talks about also. And um, Yostin, in his translation, refers us to a translation by, uh, I think, Julius Ruska of the Turbo back in the early part of the last century. So the likely reference here for nature rejoices in nature is the Turba. But the Turba is not in Greek. It just has Greek philosophers in it. The works that are in Greek would be the Pseudo-Democritus texts and the Codex. Um, recall that there is an expanded version of this nature rejoices in nature text in um, that would be nature rejoices in nature, nature rules over nature, and nature is a triumph of nature. That's in pseudo-Democritus text. D thinks it's Democritus, but now we know it is other people writing to sound like Democritus. Um, and then you find this in an important story in those texts of how Democritus was initiated into the Egyptian mysteries of Memphis by the Persian Magus Ostanes. D also refers to Ostanes in the monad. No one has found yet any historical record in Arabic, in Farsi, in Latin, anywhere of an Ostanes, but this is supposed to be a Persian Magus who initiated Democritus into the Egyptian mysteries. Um, there are some interesting little things that seem like slips and may or may not be, like the when Diomedes starts talking, he speaks he says to the last speaker that thou hast spoken already O moses well wait the last speaker is this guy named custos not moses so is this a misprint or was the last person supposed to be moses or is this a kind of uh tipping of the phrygian hat so to speak on the next page we'll get another footnote to a longer version of the quote in the isis the horus fragment um, and this is the last one of these i'm going to read to you because this is the source of the frequent um, nature begets nature. And um, well, man is able to bring forth a man, the lion begets a lion, the dog create, procreates the dog. Should it happen that a creature is produced contrary to nature, it's a monster which is engendered and it has no conscience. Then we jump down here um, about how you are illuminated by the fruit of the prayers of Isis. Um, the adepts make preparations with certain metallic mineral, and then, in fact, even as I have previously said that wheat begets wheat and man sows man, so also gold serves for the increase of gold and like things generally for the reproduction of their life. Now hath the mystery been revealed. That is supposed to be the mystery of alchemy. But it falls kind of flat, except on philosophic terms. That is, yes, there's the idea that gold and whatever you metaphorically take it to be, like perhaps, oh, the emanations of God filtered down through the Sephiroth and gold being Tifereth, that you can't um, be transmuted by that light unless you also partake of that same divine energy. That's a, a typical way to look at it. But in terms of this helping you make gold from lead? Hmm, I think we need a bit more instruction. This whole line of thought continues through the long as well as the short version of the turba. Um, here we have again, nature overcomes nature, nature rejoices in nature, nature contains nature. The essence of a thing gives birth to that thing, overcomes itself, rejoices in itself, contains itself, um, and so on. So, what conclusions can we draw from all of this? First of all, the Turba has many ideas that would greatly interest someone like John Dee. It's from the same Greco-Egyptian, Hebraic, Gnostic, alchemical current as the Codex Marcianus, Grecus, which Dee had a copy of. Dee would likely privilege the Greek text, the Codex, over the Turba, but he would also know that many, many more people would know the Turba, and also many more people know Latin than Greek. Seeing the similarities to the two is easiest if you use the weight translation. That's why that's the one I'm directing you to. The similarities affect how we look at both the monad and the later Angel Magic or Enochian work of John Dee and Edward Kelly. Most significantly, we see one of the origins of the belief that true alchemy comes from the angels and fallen angels. Now, 
combine that, say, with the story of Enoch and look for that in uh, a book of Enoch, and you kind of can encapsulate what Dee is looking for about the time that Edward Kelly or Edward Talbot appears at his front door. All right. Um, I wanted to give you some um, references that you can look at. They're just a starting point. I'm sure you can find more on your own. I'll also uh, post a screenshot of this below. So um, that's what I've got for you today. I hope you enjoy this little um, excursion into the Turbo Philosophorum. We'll look at the Codex Marcianus next, and then we'll be back and look at Theorem 20 of the Hieroglyphic Monad of John D. Have a great day. Bye-bye.